three guys who combined to play 15 seasons in the National Football League trenches. Well, two guys. And Mackey, who didn't do sh**. He just, he just sits there and looks pretty. This is the O-Line Committee. It's where, uh, where an idiot fan gets to ask dumb questions to two former NFL mm. offensive linemen, and this is going to be a juicy one today, I feel like. You guys, we did some film stuff that will be up on the YouTube channel, and uh, I can sense during NFL Cut Week here that uh, you guys, especially Jeremiah, who runs an NFL agency, for those of you that are new, a little... You guys are a little on edge here, I feel like. Slight this edge, week. slight caffeine addiction, haven't slept great the last few nights. Yeah, it's it's been a it's been a whirlwind, man. Cut weekend is especially the way they did it now where when we played, they used to go with four preseason games. After the third, you cut to 75 and then you cut down to your 53. This year they just did one foul reaper swoop, just thin the herd, right? And I mean, it's been craziness. The waiver wires got 1200 names on it i mean it is just bananas right now which is why i mean you heard it if you watch the film studies you'll know that uh you'll know that i had to take a few calls and there's a good chance i'll have to take a few calls during this one too because it's that time of year where you're getting random phone numbers that call you and you don't know who they are and you just have to pick up the phone that's the excitement of this episode right now is that at any moment literally jeremiah is going to take an important football phone call from like a general manager guy is it like is it general manager? Pro is scouts. It pro scouts. scouts. Pro okay. scouts. Yeah. And he'll just bolt for like five minutes. Well, I mean, so so yeah. So I told this on. I mean, I told this on the film review. But for those of you that don't listen to the film review, I just got off the phone. I have a client that's driving. He got released by Detroit. He's driving back to Nebraska right now because that's where he's from and where he lives. And I had a team call me. I can't say the team right now. But I had a team call me, and they were like, "Hey, we want to bring him in for a workout tomorrow morning." And I'm like, okay, well, he's driving back. And they're like, well, we need him here. And I was like, hold on. I call my client. I'm like, hey, where are you? He's like, I'm driving through Kalamazoo right now. I was like, so you're like an hour and a half from Chicago. He goes, yeah, I'll be in Chicago an hour and a half. I go, park your car, find it, get to the airport. You're going to fly out of Chicago to go work out. Called back the team. And they're like, all right, where's he coming from? I go, Chicago. I'm like, cool, sounds good. We'll have him here tomorrow. They don't care about how his car gets there. They don't care what happens to his car. They need someone to come in and work out tomorrow morning. Not tomorrow afternoon. God. tomorrow morning and so he's gonna if he gets signed by that team he's got to figure out well my car's in chicago and all my crap so hopefully i can come back and get it or tell my girlfriend mom. or dad or mom like hey mom. road trip hey, but i mean I'll that is it. that I'll is what's happening him. that's what's happening right now to him. God, i mean awesome. i guess I, I was on the phone with a team last night at 11 30 p.m central 12 30 p.m their time talking about yes or no to a practice squad spot yeah i mean there is no sleep no sleep throughout this entire weekend that goes on for any agent or really any player either that's on the bubble. And so while Jay's talking to the teams, I know I mostly get the phone calls from the players talking about what happened, what went wrong, where what are, what's going to happen next, stuff like that. That's I was just talking to one of the guys about it. Cutthroat, bro. I mean, Cutthroat. and here you want to know what's even more crazy about it is a lot of times the coaches in the front offices are on completely different pages. I had two clients this 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 go around right now that had their exit meetings. I got the call from the front office that was like, hey, we're going to release so-and-so. We kind of think we want to bring him back on our practice squad. We're not sure. You know, they hedge their bets, right? Like, and, and you can tell the difference when someone's like, oh, he's coming back, mm-hmm. right? Like, we're going to have him. Or like, the, well, we'll see what's out there, right? And so then I get a call from both players. They're like, hey, I sat down with the GM, the head coach, my position coach. All of them were like, hey, man, can't wait to have you back in the building. Don't count this as a redshirt year. You're going to have to be ready to go. Duh, duh, duh. So I have to be the one that calls my client and be like, hey, man, don't pop champagne yet. Don't pop champagne yet. Like, it's a long 24 hours that you got to clear waivers. A lot's going to happen. This is like me during high school prom season, by yeah. the way. Yes, Just like, yes. No, it really yeah. is. And, oh, and maybe. You're like and my third like, backup, Phil, but yeah, that's and they're And all of them are like, the coaches told me I'm coming back. I'm like, listen, I understand that. But sometimes the coaches, 90% of the time, aren't the ones making this decision. It's the front office. And sure enough, both those players ended up not signing back to that practice squad. And I had to make both those phone calls of like, hey, hey, buddy, how you doing? Good, how good, how are you? Got some bad news. And like, lucky enough, I was able to get another guy in another team's practice squad after hustling and, and working and talking with scouts and getting things going. The other one, not so lucky, right? And then, then they're both just kind of like, I had a grown man that I had so much respect for look me in my eye and tell me I'm coming back. And this is kind of my first... Welcome to the league, rookie. Yeah. Like the liars lie and the lies and the lies tell the lies. Like it's just the way it goes. And that's in draft time. That's during this time. And 
it, it doesn't stop here. It's throughout your entire career. It's just the nature of the business right. and what it is. <clears throat> and I had my, I, had, I tell my guys, you never send teams away with salt. Ever. You never, ever, unless your name's Alex Boone and you spike a printer on your way out. But most of the time, <laughs> that you, never, you never send the team away with salt because you never know what's going to happen. In two weeks, say, three O-linemen blow their legs up and they need another tackle that knows their system, they're going to call and claim you off their practice squad and bring you back. But if you left that place burning it on fire, they're not going to bring you back. I mean, two years ago, we had a client that was on the Rams practice squad for two years. They were going to put him back there for the third year, and we're like, you know what? We're out of here. We're jumping ship. We're sending you to another practice squad. Goes to Kansas City's practice squad. He's there for three weeks. They have three linebacker injuries in L.A. They end up claiming him off the, the Kansas City practice squad, put him on active. He's there because they had a good relationship with us as an agency, with him as a player. Gets on their active, is on active all year. This year he's going to be starting for him. Right? So you just never know. You can't burn bridges in this league. You can't no. do it. Right? Because you never know um, in free unless agency. You're- Unless you're Alex Bowden, of course. Like, but especially as a young player, because you never know. Free agency, guys getting cut all the time. Like, It's never bad to have at least one person in the organization that's like, I liked that guy. He did things the right way. He, he was a professional. He wasn't a jerk-off or he wasn't an amateur. Like, He handled his business the right way. It's a huge part of the, the chess game that you have to play between front office and player and coaches. Yeah, absolutely. And it's I mean, that's good in any business. Let's be honest. There's a lot of times we want to spike a printer on the way out, but you can't. Like you have to be grown enough to not do it. And I think that's the one thing that when you get into this business, you have to understand that not everything you hear is true. So not all the fucking things that you give back have to be true either. Uh, But you do have to leave with a smile and the handshake and say thank you for everything, right? You don't have to mean it. I knew a lot of guys that were like, dude, I hate this place, but I'm going to go up there the same as everybody else and be like, thanks for the whole year. Thanks for the checks. Appreciate everything. Hopefully I'll see you down the road. Because Jay's right. In the league now especially, they don't care. I think before... You know, there was times where in conference people would try and pull practice squads from each other to try and get vet things, but now it's like they're going all over to find people. They don't care. They want the best talent. So if you leave, and two, this kind of spawns into you might be talking to a scout at one point, and in five years he's a GM. And if you leave that dude with salt and now he's a GM, what do you think he's telling all the other GM friends? Like You don't know where people are going to go in this business. It, yep. it happens everywhere. Players are turning into coaches. They're turning into GMs. It's almost like you have to be just – cool all the time around everybody because all of a sudden some guy that was a low level assistant saw you blow up now he's the assistant gm somewhere and it's your contract here and he's like dude i was there with that dude and so and so and i'm so, that dude is a problem all right we don't want that he's it's gonna be bad all of a sudden that little bit goes into the gm's ear like how do you know this well i was there with him i saw it ah tell me more all of a sudden you don't know what people know and that's why people in this business get screwed so bad is because they don't realize that everyone around them is a player they might be low level right now but in four years that's going to be the assistant to the dude and what is he going to be telling him you want them to always be like he was the first one in the last one out never saw him in the training room worked his ass off yes all the time never heard no out of his mouth played like a tough guy like these are what you want people saying you don't want them like dude if we piss this guy off, he's not going to play for four weeks. Like that's what you yeah. don't want. And and it's also why we tell guys in the recruiting process, like you have to have an agent that you trust because right. we are really the only ones that will tell you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. Right? Like the fact that I had to tell my client, like who was so excited that he was going back to the practice squad, he couldn't believe that, like super pumped. I had to be the one that was like, "Hey, Simmer, this isn't real." Right. And I, he, and that's not something he wanted to hear, but he knew from the beginning that's who I was. And I I played this game. I've been lied to my face, looked in my eyes and told me, and I'm, I'm conditioned to it. But you know, you have to understand these young players, they're not conditioned to just being straight up lied to. Right. Right. And sometimes it's not even their fault. Sometimes the coaches are just telling them what they know, you know, but you can get really jaded really quickly in this league and you just have to have thick skin about it. So, why? So, why? Because they came from college where nobody told any lies and everything was okay, honey. You're so pretty. I love you. I love go go make a lot of money now. And then they turn around and go, Thank God that guy's gone. Jesus Christ, who's next? Come here, pretty. You look so pretty. And then you go to a league where everyone all they see is the ugliness on you and they're like, God, you're so dirty and ugly. Like, go take a shower. You're like, Coach, I, I don't think I can watch this film anymore. They're mm-hmm. like, Then you clearly don't belong. Get the hell out of here, stupid. And you're like, Okay, I guess I'll leave. But Jay's right. Like, when they tell you, and I used to see it with guys. They would come down or you would run into them. They'd be like, dude, they were going to bring me back on P-Squad. I'd be like, they tell you that? They, ta- they told me that they want to. I'd be like, 
Okay. They didn't tell you they're gonna? No. <sighs> okay. Mm. You're like, man. Totally gonna buy you that engagement ring. Totally. Oh, yeah, I haven't been to the I, store yet. It's but at home. It's on my I list. I left it at home. Tomorrow, we'll call your agent. We'll set it all up. You yeah. go out, get dinner with the, the old lady, and you're like, this is great. Next day, no phone call. It's. I mean, it happened to me with the with the Vikings. It's my exit there. my exit meeting in 2017. Um, at the end of the year, they're like, hey, you played a lot for us. Super excited. We're going to put a tender on you. You know, you'll be back here. No problem. Um, I'm at the O-line trip in Miami, and it's during combine time, and my agent called me. He goes, just got to meet with the Vikings. They're not going to tender you. It's like, oh. But, and you were on a trip with, like, the other Vikings offensive line. Yeah, lineman. it was our end-of-the-year trip. And so, like, I took the phone call, went back into dinner, and I was like, well, boys, it was really fun, but I won't be here next year. And wow. it was just kind of one of those things. It's just like, yeah, I mean, they at that point, I was in year five, so I was like, I get it. Like, I mean, nothing's set in stone until the ink is dry. Right until the ink is dry on the contract, nothing is set in stone. God, hey, let me let me ask the first dumb football question here, which is kind of the the format of that this podcast has taken. And we'll get we'll get to you guys have sent a bunch of fun dumb football questions. Keep sending them in the YouTube comments, and and we'll read them to the to the guys here. But you know, we've gotten a little bit of a glimpse thanks to Hard Knocks over the years. Like there's a clip that resurfaced in the last couple of days of Mike Tannenbaum, you know, 12 years ago cutting Kevin O'Connell. And yeah. just flat out telling him very awkwardly, you know, we had higher hopes for you, but, uh, you know, you just got beat out and whatever. And Kevin O'Connell was, you know, he was probably raging inside. But just like Alex said, it's like, oh, I love my Thank experience you. here. Thank you so much. You know, here's a handshake. So my question is, aside from what we sort of see a little bit behind the curtains on Hard Knocks, what is the actual cut day like? Oh, are, 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 are GMs what? generally good or bad at it? Like, uh. Like, how do they... What is it like for players on actual training camp cut day? So I've only been I've only been actually cut twice on cut day. First one was my rookie year, and they fed me the song and dance of "We're going to sign you back to practice squad." And lucky enough, it was true for me, right? And so, like, I didn't. But it, and then the second time was when I got um, cut in Carolina, and I was injured. Right, I was injured, and it's one of those things where you're walking around the locker room all day. And you're seeing dudes pack their bags up in literal trash bags, and they're just leaving, and you'll never see them again. And you're just looking for the guy known as the Reaper, right? Every team has one. He's the Reaper. He walks around with a clipboard, and he walks into the locker room, and you make eye contact with him, like, "Hey, asshole, you better not look at me, right? Like, don't you, don't you even look at me, right?" And then they'll move on. But I got, it. I got yanked one time. I was in the weight room. I was getting a lift in, and they came in. They're like, "Hey, Rivera and Marty Herney want to see you." And sure enough, I walked in there. And they were basically like, hey, you're going to get injury released. Um, we have too many guys, this, that, and the other thing. You did a great job. You were going to make our team if you weren't hurt, blah, 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 blah. Again, you're just kind of like, okay, here we go. And I was so pissed off, I got in my car and drove 18 hours back to Nebraska from Carolina straight. Just so upset, right? And, I mean, GMs, are, are some are good, some are bad. Usually a lot of them understand that they can understand the temperature of the room. Um, right. And that's because they have to do it. And like, no one wants to tell a kid the dream is over. I don't think any GM or anyone takes pleasure in cutting people, No, you know, because it's not a fun thing to do to tell someone you're just not good enough, you know, but at the end of the day, they have to understand it's a business. That's what this business is. It's as cutthroat as it comes. And they have to just be professional about it. Agreed. I, Jeremiah's same sentiment. I, on cut days, I was never there at the facility. You'd never wanted to be around the facility. It was kind of the day to just stay away as much as you can. Don't go in for any reason. If you forgot something, you'll get it tomorrow. It's just, it's a rough, because you've been with these guys for so long, and some of them, you're just like, man, I feel so bad. This guy worked so hard, had no idea the whole time. I would, I'd like to think that guys like John Lynch would be really good at it, being former players, that they would be a little bit more straightforward. You know, I feel like there's times where you hear about guys getting cut and things being said, and you're like, you know, a former player wouldn't have said that. Somebody that actually respects the game probably wouldn't have made a comment like that. Wouldn't have backhanded you on the way out. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, it's one of those things where it's really hard in the moment because it is an emotional game and it's a physical game. And then all of a sudden someone's like, hey, by the way, you're just not good enough. Sorry, you got to go. And you're like, well, that hurt. And then they kind of throw something on top of it where you're like, that wasn't needed. You know, I think that sometimes that happens. And at times guys are a little bit oblivious to it. There were guys that were like, can you believe? And you're like, yeah, dude, coach has been asking for three weeks to fix this. You haven't fixed yet. What did you think was going to happen? Like, yeah. It's just like Jay said. 
If they want it done in the morning, it gets done in the morning. If you can't be there for the morning, then we'll see you next year. We'll see you next time. You know what I'm saying? That's how it goes, and you learn that quickly in the league when guys are like, hey, coach has had to say this twice to you. Fix it now. And you're like, oh, thanks, man. I, I, I don't know how I missed all that in the shuffle. And then all of a sudden, as a young player, you start to get it. Like, okay, if they want something fixed, fix it. But when the guys are like, I had no idea this is coming, and you're like, dude, you, you broke curfew. How, how did you not have an idea that this was coming down the old piper? You know, those, those are the ones where I'm like, I, I don't really feel bad about it. But the guys that came in, worked hard, did their work, and get cut, you just feel really bad for them because sometimes it's the end of the dream for them, you know, and you're part of that end of the dream and they'll remember you forever because they're like, this was my one time in the league and these were the guys I was with. And you're like, man, I hope it was fun. And that's why at the end of camp, we always try to go out and do stuff as an O-line before all that happened. And then at the end of the year, like Jay said, the teams are never the same. Never two years in a row can a team ever be the same. Somebody has always gone from a room. So it's like at the end of the year, you talk about being on a trip with all the guys that you're with. I mean, your best friends, and all of a sudden you get the phone call like, hey, you're not going to be with those guys anymore. Pack it up. Let's go. You know, and that's really how it goes. Oh, did they kick you off the trip, by the way? No. Oh, sorry, no, man. Anything, you're, no. that makes you you're not a Viking I, I, anymore. I did go out and had one too many cocktails <laughs> that night, though. I'll tell you that. But that's, but that's what I'm sure it ruined, though. I'm sure everybody was pissed then. And everybody, because that's how we are. When one of the guys, one of the core guys is told you're not coming back and you're out with the guys, you're like, man, this sucks. I don't want to go back anymore. Like, this is... And you don't see it sometimes from afar. And all of a sudden, you're like, when you get older, you're like, man, I should have probably seen some of this stuff coming a little bit farther away. It's, but, it's also one of those things when you, get, when you get traded or you get cut and then you get picked up by another team, that dynamic is really weird too. Alex, you can probably speak to this of being in the room, but like I know when I got traded to the Vikings in 2015, I walked into that room. I was a second-year player, really didn't know what was going on. And I couldn't make any friends, and I couldn't really understand why no one wanted to talk to me. And a lot of it was the older guys obviously are in game week, and they're trying to get ready to go, right? I got traded week one. And so they're prepped on game week, and so I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be a friends. And then all the other guys like that I got brought in that had been there that entire offseason, that entire training camp, and they got released, and they bring in this dude from San Diego, and they're like, I don't want to be friends with that guy. He took my spot. Yeah. Right? Like, or like, And everyone else was like, he took my buddy's spot. Right, like it was actually a really lonely year for me in 2015 because like no one knew who I was, no one knew anything about me, and no one really wanted to be my friend because I came in and took a buddy's spot. Right, like it's just it's a weird dynamic to come into because you want to come in and be like, prove yourself. I I deserve to be here. I earned it. They wanted me, but the rest of the room, like you haven't earned any of the respect because they haven't seen you work. They don't know anything that you did, and you have to come in and and really gain that room's trust during the season, which is really really hard to do. And not only yeah. that, but you got to gain the trust of the whole team. And that's yeah. hard to do, too, because defensive players are like, week eight, like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> Dude, he's been with us well, for like eight weeks. So, what do you mean? <laughs> I, I have a funny story about that in Buffalo, right? So in Buffalo, I got picked up week four, right? So after I got cut by Carolina, I had a hamstring injury. I rehabbed it, went out to Buffalo, worked out on a Friday. And they were like, hey, we're going to sign you on Monday after our game. And so they signed me on Monday. And then I'm there on Tuesday. So our first Wednesday practice, right? It's a full pad practice. And there's this D lineman that is just him and I are just going after each other, right? Like he's on the scouty, I'm on the scouty, and like or he's on the twos and I'm I'm running the scouty and we're just going after it. And it's a goal line period. And I end up pushing him over a pile and he gets up and starts swinging, right? So I start swinging and we're fighting and as i'm we're fighting we're realizing no one is coming to help either one of us right like we're both just sitting there fighting like idiots right and so then like hold me back eventually me back, eventually it like ends right because eventually like all right dumbasses get back in the huddle and then after practice i went up and just kind of shook his hands like hey man sorry i'm new here like i just got here and he goes oh yeah i just got here on tuesday too and so both of us were brand new to the team no one like, knew who we really were and i could just picture the rest of the team being like who are these idiots yeah. like they just got here they're fighting each other right and it ended up being jordan phillips from miami and who's with buffalo and so like we actually became pretty good friends after that uh, just because one of those things where it's like we were just fighting, it was like watching the two new kids fight that no one had any skin in the game whatsoever. <laughs> they were just like, oh, let's they can fight to the death yeah, and yeah, no like, one cares. No, we'll just we'll just figure it out. Like people were <laughs> probably like, I don't even know who's who's seventy four and ninety seven. Who are those guys? Do they even play on this team? Yeah, I just want it noted that both of you went in with the right mentality. We are yeah. gonna fight until somebody pulls me out, and yeah. that <laughs> is the fucking problem nowadays. Is nobody goes in with the right mentality, like. 
Jay just told you, I went in day one and a fight broke out and I knew I had to start swinging. Why? Because yeah. that's the mentality of the old lineman. And if you don't swing, what's going to happen? You're going to get cut. Why? Because a fight broke out your first day and you got bitched out by some D lineman whose first day it was too. And the two of you didn't even know the rules and you didn't even swing. But your rules in your head should always state that if I get swung on, I'm swinging back. Like that's yeah. how it goes. That's why and, I find this awesome. Yeah. And day one, I was like, I ain't going to get punked by anyone. No. I'm in yeah, year you five. Know the rules. Like I'm in year five. Like I'm not a rookie, right? Like I'm not a rookie. I'm a vet. I've played in NFL games before. Like I'm not going to get punked. And he thought the same thing. <laughs> Right, and it's just it, it, it was funny. McDermott actually came up to me afterwards. He's like, "I like that." And I was like, "Thank See? you, coach. Thank you, yeah. sir." Right, like, and and it set the tone for the kind of player that I was going to be. Right, and you have to, and I earned respect in the O line room. Right, oh, I earned respect in the O line room where all those guys were like, "Hey, all right." Like I, the next day, they're like, "I see you. I see you, seventy four. Like, they didn't even know my name yet. Like, yeah. I see, you, I see you, seventy four. <laughs> right. It's like it's just one of those things where it's like it's the mentality I had as an undrafted mentality, which is I don't take shit from no one. Right, I've earned everything I've been given. There's a reason they cut that dude and brought me in here. Right, like I'm not going to just back down. Like I'm here to take this job and not let anyone take it from me. Yeah, and I ended up dressing the next week. Like that's just you have to have that cutthroat mentality in the league, or else you will not last. That's why I think people don't understand how the league really is. Is that's how it is all everywhere. Like if a fight breaks out and I'm in the middle of it, I guess I'm gonna have to swing back. I got stuck in the middle of this, but then all of a sudden every coach on the side is like, "Yo, great job." <laughs> Yeah, I love that shit. Like, that's what you want. You want the coaches pulling you aside. Sure, in front of the team, he's going to cuss me out. You know what this is going to cost us in the game? 15 yards, you stupid shit. You're like, all right, whatever, dude. But then he pulls you aside. He's like, yo, for real, though, that shit was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, what did you think about Stefanski's rule in uh, in Cleveland with the joint practices? Did you see that rule? No. What's Where, rule? Like, so, like, it was the last preseason game. And it was joint practices with, uh, oh gosh, I can't New remember England, who it was. Right? Maybe. But he came out and he's like, I made a rule this week to make sure there was no fights. Because there had been so many fights in joint practices up to this point, right? Mm -hmm. There was that brawls. Fuck, yeah. And he, so he literally goes, here's the rules. If you're a starter and you get in a fight, you have to play in the last preseason game, even though yeah. none of the starters are playing. If you're a young guy fighting for a job and you get in a fight, you will not be allowed to play in the last preseason game. I was like, that's the best way to – I've never seen a better way to – It's Yeah. You could have punched – That's better than a fine, Dude, right? if I was a young guy <laughs> – I was If I was a young guy and someone started swinging on me, I would have just sat there with my hands behind my back and be like, I'm playing in this game. There ain't no <laughs> well in, like, And if you're a starter, the last thing you want to do is be the only one Aww. out there. <laughs> the <laughs> only job, starter out ass. there. Like the yeah, whole man. one on the side of me, like, hey, the was those punches? Eight-year guard just sitting out yeah. there. Were those Son punches worth bitch. it? Were those punches worth it nine <laughs> on seven? Huh? Were they worth it? <laughs> I thought it was fantastic. I I've thought it was the greatest thought, rule ever. You I've always thought that you know, you know, hockey's had fighting in the actual games for a long time, and I've always kind of clowned on it because it's like, okay, so the game just stops. Like two guys just drop their gloves, and everyone just watches Amazing. until one of them hits the ice. So you know what? Yes, I've been missing the boat on this. We need this in football. No, where the, where no, where no, it's no, every play. everyone no. circles around. No. circles around you drop no. your helmets you know you no. you crack your knuckles Mac, you're gonna go from one guy dropping his helmet in a fight to another guy dropping his helmet now his friend's gonna stuck up for him and his friend's gonna you're gonna have yes and if you win the fight for a game you win the fight your team gets two points or something Listen, let's put it on you the have scoreboard. to understand this too hockey players love them to death think they're tough as nails i think they're all fantastic you put a bunch of NF nhl hockey players in a room with random people you really can't pick them out different wise now imagine well, they're, they're, they're like bold, they're bow legged, right? But, but like, other just than like that, physically, <laughs> like now imagine like Zach Martin and Jeffrey Simmons getting in a fist fight. Yeah, one of them's gonna get really hurt. Like you're gonna land one of those punches and shatter like an orbital bone and like have <laughs> traumatic brain injuries because like the force in which these dudes can fight are not the 165 pound hockey player. It's a 320-pound man that benches 600 pounds that is going to punch you in your teeth, and you're going to lose your jaw. This, like, by the way, what you've just described, so you're like boxing was the most, but it was like boxing, horse racing, and baseball were the most popular sports like 60 years ago, 100 years ago, and boxing's kind of died. I am more interested in boxing now that it's like, let's put a YouTuber against Floyd Mayweather, or like, let's put... Adrian Peterson's gonna fight Le'Veon Bell. Like they don't know how to box, but <laughs> fuck, I'll I'll pay fifty bucks to watch like pe people that I know get in a ring and fight. Yeah. We're gonna put this is how UFC started back like thirty years ago. There were no weight classes. Right. It, it it would just be like 
Here's a here's a jujitsu expert against a sumo wrestler, and they have a thirty minute time limit, and one of them's probably gonna die. That was like what was it? The backyard stuff with Kimbo Slice. Oh, yeah, those those backyard (laughs) balls. You're just watching Kimbo Slice just Slice on YouTube. Yeah, just knocking dudes' teeth out. Right, and then they put him in an octagon, and they were like, "Oh, he can't actually fight." He was like blown up after forty five seconds. But yeah, like I'm fighting, fighting, in the glass house, fighting by the can way. never happen in the NFL. No, 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 no. Too many big, powerful humans. Too many no. of them. Um, okay, I've got some dumb football questions from our YouTube audience here. The Let's best. start with with this one from Iden Hoke. He says, "How do players and teams deal with physical peaking?" So, speaking of MMA, he says, "An MMA fighter isn't at their physical best all the time. They train to peak at the fight. Same with like." Tour de France or other athletes. Uh, so with the season being months long, how do you balance your physical abilities? Is that what backups at some positions are for? Do you go into certain games at your best? Like, I guess, how do you peak so, physically when you're supposed to? When you're peaking physically, normally they try to get you to hit the peak at the beginning of the year, and that's what camp is for, just kind of ramp you up. They start hitting you more with different types of lifts. But once you start the season – you're done peaking. There is no Mm -hmm. more peaking. You are maintaining. The whole job of the strength coach is to maintain your physical strength or at least keep it up there as high as he can. Because you have to remember, while you go into the season squatting 550 pounds, by week six, you can't put 225 on your back. So you're like, hey, we have to be smart. We have to find different ways to work this body part. That's why all of a sudden we started using pit sharks or we'll start using Kaiser bells and stuff like this. Like everything becomes a lift and it's on the strength coach job to be creative. These guys can never run. Why? Because if they are, they're in a game. That's the only time they're running is in a game. They can lift, but not very heavy. And if they do lift heavy, it has to be right after the game. And now I was always told that Mondays was always squat day because you could still feel the tortle. Oh yeah, baby. Tortle, tortle Mondays. That's a fact. You woke up on Wednesday like, shoot me in the face. (laughs) Toward all Tuesdays. Toward all Tuesdays. Toward all Tuesdays. I didn't get out of bed. Nope. You were (laughs) broken. But one of the things that I found was being a dad was that the more active I was on Tuesday, the better I felt by Wednesday. So I always became the one that was involved in like taking the kids around and moving around. My wife always used to make me go to the mall on Tuesday because I'd be like, I just don't want to move. She'd be like, let's go to the mall. I'll get you lunch. I'd be like, oh. I'm coming. Give me 20 I'm trying to vision Booney, 320 pounds at the Galleria. So, and he died. <laughs> oh, my God. Don't get me started. A cove over there. I used to crush some lunch. Oh. How about Restoration Hardware? You ever been to oh. the top of that place? Don't get Talk me dirty. start. Right? And all of a sudden, or you just go to a Lion's Tap up the street, and I'd be like, that's good enough for me. But, dude, it is hard. And so that's why when you start thinking about, like, as a real pro, like as a rookie, you're not a real pro because you're like, dude, I made it. I'm going to go eat whatever I want and do whatever I want. I'm young, but like the minute you hit year two, you start to realize like, I don't feel as good as I did last year. My knees don't work as well as they do when I eat like this. All of a sudden, that's when nutrition becomes huge and you have to start eliminating things from your diet. Like one of the rules I always had during the season was like no fried food other than Monday. Like no fried food. I never drink pop anyway, so I didn't have to worry about that. Like no sugar during the week because I always felt like if I had some, it made me play really slow. So it was just like meat, vegetables, fruit, and grains. That was it. And then you see as you go on, guys in the league, as I started to leave, got way more serious. Like with Russ, it was like I was – when I first got there, I was put in the stadium, and that was back when there was no fans. And so we had to sit in the suites, and so it was like two players to a suite. And so I got put in one of the suites with his medical staff doctor. And so she was watching him the entire game, like through all these computers and monitors and like elevating him and trying to figure out what was wrong. And I was like, this is like the PFF of fucking like medicalness. Like you have analytics for everything. This is for Russell Wilson, for Russell Wilson. And I was like, oh my goodness, like guys are so serious and like you would play I played with Larry Fitzgerald and he was another one who like the food at Arizona was great I loved it it was phenomenal but he had his own like thing going on where he knew the chefs and he was like yo this is and his food was just like perfectly cooked but then you look at him and he's such a specimen and when he's told to like run really fast he's just okay and then you see other guys and they're like give me a second I gotta get warmed up like you can see who takes care of their body and who doesn't and you're starting to see that guys that don't are getting cut faster because their team's starting to see it. They're starting to take more intake on guys. Like 
when I got there, body weight was the only thing people cared about, right? Jay, you got to weigh in on Tuesday. You got to weigh in on Friday. Why? Because if Tuesday's weight's good, we're not guaranteed that your crazy ass isn't going to go out and eat a bunch of ice cream and be fat for the game. So we got to <laughs> weigh, reweigh in, right? And then now all of a sudden it's become, let's test their body fat. And let's see where their body fat is at the beginning of the year. And let's see where it is at the end of the year. And even so more to this, and this is more my theory, and I don't know, I've heard this a few times, but they're putting metrics on guys now where they can see how fast you're moving and how well you're moving. And now it's starting to become, what else are you using that for? Like, I get what the science behind it is too, but there has to be a scary thought in everybody's mind that they're also watching how slow am I deteriorating. Hey, oh, listen, yeah. from, from week one to week 17, this is what we saw on these monitors. Let's see what happens when he comes back this year. We'll put it on for camp and see if anything happens. Like, it's just another way to watch, guys. So that's why it's like you have to always combat that with I eat right, I do right, I'm in bed, I'm eating everything. Like, because they're constantly finding ways to find better athletes. Find a better Is that what guy. those catapult things yeah. are for? Yeah, you know, measuring. that was like a big thing. People yeah. saw Kyler Murray was like, he was shirtless well, he and like he had the idiot. catapult thing. People are like, you're yes. like, what is he? Is he wearing a bra? It's like, these have been around for 10 years, I'm pretty yeah. sure, right? You get they it's like measure tracking, like, motion tracking. They're, they're tracking how many, like, how much distance are you running during the week in practice, right? How many yards are you covering? How fast are you going? Max acceleration, full speed, all those things. And yeah, it's just a metric to like, A, it's said they're using to like make sure the manager which they workload, do. which they, they do, do sometimes right? like, to manage your say, workload, hey, listen, right? You've ran this much this week. We need to cut it down to this. So we're going to take this many reps out. You're like, all right, son of a bitch. You're actually yeah. using this thing. This is great. The other, the other thing to go back to like peak peaking physically. I learned this the hard way after my first year, like I was on practice squad and then I got active and I played my last two games. And so like, I finished this season on like the super high of like, I can do this. Right. And I started crushing, working out super, super hard, like mid-January, right? Like absolutely getting after it. Sled pushes, squatting heavy, da, da, da. and I felt like, okay, I got to come into OTAs like physically ready to roll, right? And I kind of, I peaked too early. I peaked in like May physically, right? And I, by the time camp ended, I had taken so many reps and everything, like I couldn't keep weight on no matter what I ate. And I realized like I had worked myself too hard earlier in the year. Like I always tell guys, you need to come into OTAs at like 60, 65% physically of where you want to be when you show back up in August, right? Because if you peak early in May, it's like Boone said, you have to be able to peak in August or really you won't, you don't want to peak till late August, right? You want to come into That's camp different. at like 90%. You want to peak week one because that whole maintain thing, it sounds great, but in reality, it's how, how can I slow the decline? Right. It's how can I keep myself from declining at a rapid rate? How can I keep it from falling off the cliff? Because everyone's going to decline throughout the season. There's no way, shape, or form that you do, you finish the season the same way you started it. Right? You always decline. Are so you the same about, weight at the end of the season? No. Mm -mm. I used I, I used to I used to come into camp at like three fifteen, and I by the end of the season I'm praying to hang on to three hundred five, three hundred three. Wow. Like you like, were three hundred. Oh. Yeah, I mean, and the other thing too is like from when a he's a buck ninety, just from also from a different perspective of like being a backup, right? Like Booney's coming from a starter, and like I was a starter for a while, but for my majority of my career, I was I was kind of that backup six man. Your workload is much different than the starter, right? Because you have to keep your body. You have to keep your body in physical, like that strength mode, so that when you do go in, like you're still as strong as you could be because you're not taking the reps on game week. Like you're taking, you have to take your your lifts, your run. You lift an extra day of the week when you're not a starter, because you have to keep that strength up because you're not getting the same workload that those other guys are getting on Sundays, right? So the physical peakness is way different for a backup or even a practice squad player than it is for a starter. Like there's levels to it of how heavy are you still developing. Right, practice squad. I lifted four days a week, right? Because I was like, I ain't playing on Sunday, so I can crush myself throughout the week, and then I'll recover on the weekend, right? Like, there's just different levels of physical preparedness that each player has to find for themselves. But I think the biggest thing is just making sure guys don't burn themselves out in the off season, so that by the time the season rolls around and it's week twelve, your body's just crashing. Yeah, like, it's impossible to maintain that for six, eight months. Like, you have to just say, hey, I have a four month window here that I got to try and maintain. And it's just a matter of learning what that looks like. And really, a lot of guys don't get to do it until their second year because rookie year, you're going through combine, all-star games. Like, there is no ramp-up rookie year. It is just full pedal to the wall. You have to really learn that in years two and three of how that ramp-up is different for everybody for nutrition and training and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, this next question comes from social media here. Just uh, saw this floating around a couple weeks ago. 
Now you guys, did, you guys played in the NFL, so you might be in a little bit of a different situation than the normal person here answering this question. But I'm going to ask it anyways. All right. You get a billion dollars right now, tax free, dumped into whatever account you want. Here's a billion dollars, but the catch is peak Mike Tyson in his prime, prime Mike Tyson will hunt and try to kill you for the rest of your life. But you get to use the billion dollars however you want resourcefully to try and fend that off from happening. Do you I mean, take the billion dollars? Just have a bunch of books surrounding your just have a bunch of books surrounding your house because I don't think Mike can read. <laughs> um, or is that Mayweather? One of them. They might both. Well, I think Ma- well, probably both, but I think Mayweather. I mean, I, I think I take the billion. I would take, I would I'd take the billion. You take the billion. I I'd take I the billion. I mean, there's enough you could do to protect yourself at all times. I mean, you'd be always fine. be on a boat or like hire a, hire a, hire a black have, ops I'd security have the best, team. I'd have the best right? security team of all time for the rest of my life, and also like. It's a billion dollars. Like yeah. that is so <laughs> much money. money. Like you could do anything with a billion dollars. You could also spend it like on the best hand to hand combat training. Too. No, you could. It, that doesn't matter. Hi, 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 fight him. You have dude. a billion dollars. Get yeah. somebody else to do it. What do you I mean, agree. I'm just. You know, just I would a billion. I would almost hire Wouldn't a body double. To... I'd hire a body double and just have him be with me everywhere. And if all of a sudden I see Mike, I'm like, Trick go. Him. If you you run over there and I'll run away. And then like if he kills him, they'd be like, oh, I'll just hire another one. God, but wouldn't it be great though if you could train yourself? Like, take twelve months, train yourself oh, to end God. the problem. You know, I don't think I don't know, dude. Mike Tyson did, is prime Maggie, for years. any of us. <laughs> any of us. I don't care how long we train. I'm not sure any of us would be able to take out Mike Tyson in his prime. Yeah, I really Mike don't. Tyson. I mean, and even if we trained for years, I mean, maybe if we started, we were like twenty. 18 that's true you know you're like, like thir- i'm 30 i'm 32 tough. like i don't care if i train if i train for eight years i'm still gonna be 40 and if mike tyson's hunting me around like we're thorough we're, th- we're thorough that <laughs> like there's no <laughs> way i'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick, kick, I'm kick that. thorough that i'm gonna get my, ty- my tiger thon him i'm gonna find him <laughs> like there's no draw way tattoo on his faith after i'm done <laughs> kicking his ass too there's no way <laughs> I mean, the hard part would be he'd have to try and say my address, and I'm going with every, 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 like a lot of sevens in my address. Here. There are so many sevens, so many sevens. sevens. All right, I got one more for you guys here. From this I is can. from from. Uh, it's like Everson. Everson used to have that Liz dude. Yeah. I'll never forget what time he came on the sideline. And again, I'm not trying to drag Everson. He goes, "Hey, hey, Thurl, hey, Thurl, see that spin move? Thack, thack, <laughs> thack, spin move." And I was just like, "Yep, hey. sure thing, Ev." He used to be so calm when he would talk to it. That's exact fact. That's fact. 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 Really? You know, super random. Not even I a story. Him, just dude. an anecdote. The night. Remember the night that uh, the NBA shut down at the beginning of the pandemic. Like Rudy yeah. Gobert, he did like he got COVID or something. So when that game was on TV that night, yeah, this touches everyone's stuff. That night, my wife and I were at Crave in uh, West End sitting right next to just randomly literally right next to everson griffin just hanging out we're all just like eating steaks yeah. whatever watching tv together you know he's just pointing up at the tv you know, oh, some shit you know dude ev, ev was the best i loved ev. Best. i loved ev to death i yeah. i love that guy it's a fun guy man me home, I wish that me guy home. well i got one more for you guys here from Fact. dr patrola uh and we got i don't know, we got three five minutes left here we got plenty just, of time Starting from you haven't even had to jump on an emergency call yet, so not yet. Do that, that means happen. good things right now. So, Doctor Patrola says, starting from the rookie season, how many years does it take to fully form offensive linemen? Generally speaking, from when you enter the NFL to when you are like fully formed, whatever whatever that means. Man, I don't know that there's actually an answer to that. I think that every year you're starting to so learn many, more stuff. So there's many different so factors. There's so much stuff that you learn, and there's so much new lingo that you pick up, and there's so many new things. But I would say that an offensive lineman, and to, and I'm not trying to rag on anybody, but I just don't think that there's – the development of offensive linemen is really there. I think that a lot of In it college, is, you mean. Correct. Which – it's hard because, and we've talked about this, right? College coaches have so many people to please. Hey, pretty, you're so pretty, right? But you're pretty too, honey. And in the NFL, it's like, why does this dude need me to tell him he's pretty every day? Dude, you are ugly. Figure it out. Like, And then all of a sudden, it's like, what happens then? And it, 
I would say now under the proper development, it would probably take a good two or three years to make a good offensive well, line. Because I, and I, I say that knowing this, you have to go out and fail a ton before you can mm, learn. And mm. that's what you're going to learn in those two years. You're going to learn all the wrong things to do, which is going to key in all the right things to do. And that's how you learn such good instincts is by messing it up. And then your body goes, I'll never forget that. I will never forget that I need to get depth on this set. Why? Because I got beat. And those, that's what separates a pro from an amateur, right? And I was talking to my son's team about it the other day. The sixth grade boys. An amateur does it until he gets it right. A pro does it till he can't get it wrong. And that's what the difference between us is. Is the minute it hits you instinctually, you're like, I got it. I figured it out now. But sometimes it's a really harsh lesson because you got to go out and get your ass dragged through the weeds for a long time. But then you stand up and you're like, well, now I know a lot of different systems. And I understand why people are doing this to us. And I understand why they're attacking us the way that they are. And I understand how we can counteract this now. And it's like, it's a bunch of chess pieces being moved around the board. And it's how long can you figure out the game while getting your ass kicked. And that's what's the hardest thing is why you're losing. People are like, hey, you're learning. And you're like, am I? Or am I just losing? What's the difference? And they're like, well, are you figuring out what you should be doing? Yeah. Are you trying to apply it? No. Well, do that, stupid. And then you'll be figuring it out. It's like there's so many steps to it that makes it hard. That's why you can't be like, oh, one training camp, you should be good. Dude, you don't yeah. even know what's going on after a training camp. I also think a big factor to it, too, is how many O-line coaches in the league have you had? You know, it's, I think yeah. if you can ha if you can be in the same system with the same OC and the same O line coach for three years, rookie year, second year, third year, the beginning of that third year, you should have it pretty well dialed in, right? But the problem is becoming you're seeing the coaching carousel, you're seeing the head coaching carousel. Like if all of a sudden you were this regime's guy for a year and a half, and then they get fired, and you bring in another guy who's now you're not his guy. He didn't draft you. Maybe you're in a completely different system now. Like, and guys are like, oh, that guy was a bust. It's like, well, you got to remember, he got drafted two years ago to a power system, and now you threw him into this outside zone, wide zone system. Like, that's probably not best for him. Mm -hmm. right. right. And so then it's like, you get cut, you get brought up somewhere else. Now you're learning someone else's lingo, someone else's techniques. Like, that's where you really see a lot of young guys fail is when you see multiple coaches and multiple systems that they're in over and over again because they can't fail. Because as soon as they're trying to fail, it's something brand new. Right. And so now they're actually losing instead of failing because it's not into their skill set or they're trying to learn a whole brand new skill set. Like, there's so many different factors that play into that. But I really do think you see guys that are going to be stick in this league, like starters, guys are going to stick around for this league. If they're still contributing in a big way in year three, then they're going to stick around for year six, seven, and eight, as long as their bodies can. It's getting through those first three years that is incredibly important and incredibly hard. You just yeah. hit, like, it's it's kind of like a, a graph or whatever where your mind is going to keep getting sharper every year until you're like 80 or whatever right, right? you're going to keep getting sharper sharper so as long as your body can can stay your you know can when so your body a, starts to decline you know it's funny it, you bring that up it's a weird curve and that nflpa actually pulls it up sometimes and it's the curve of like what you're expected to be and in the beginning it's super strong and fast right so you want strong fast guys while your intelligence is down low but somewhere in the middle they're going to cross over where all of a sudden you start to get broken but you know a lot and then you know a ton, but you're not very good. And then all of a sudden you become savvy. And that's why the curve kind of crosses over. And it's that curvature where it crosses over that three, four year mark that's like, hey, if you can figure it out now, you don't need to, you'll figure out that you don't need to be as strong as you think you do. You don't mm -hmm. need to squat 700 pounds. You don't need to be able to bench a thousand. You just need to know where to be and when to be there. And from there, coaches will teach you great technique. They'll teach you things to learn, like how to do a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? A guy's running at you with his hands out. What do you do? We'll smack him away. We'll grab him. We'll pull him in, like all these things. But it's that curvature point where people are looking at you like, okay, what does he know? How smart is he? We get that he probably doesn't run a 4-5 anymore, but what does he know? Does he know enough to move forward? Yeah, good. Here we go. He's our guy. And if it's like, no, he can't recite the offense back to us, get rid of him then. He's clearly in yeah. a decline. He can't figure it out. He's on his way out. It's harsh, yeah. but it's the yeah. reality of being a pro. And, yep. and, that, and that's why quarterbacks, yeah. like the fact that quarterbacks physically now, because of the rules, can they can play into their mid to late 30s, early 40s. They've racked up 15 years of institutional knowledge and the, right. the game has slowed down and they're still near their 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 peak physically. Like, Well, you, you know, know what helps them the checkmate. most is when they take those Tuesdays off and right back to the fan mail. 
I, for one, sure could use thing. 24 hours off from sure work thing, on a Tuesday. Walter, <laughs> I would love to write you back. I didn't Dude, have a chance to look up. I got stuck with him in my fantasy draft as my quarterback. I'm oh, not, oh not, come on. It's Kirk O'Chains. It's Kirk O'Chains. Let's but go. But I also took Hawkinson, and I was like, well, okay, let me play some chess here. Kirk is in a one-year contract, which means Kirk ain't going to want to get hit. So what's he going to do? Just check it down to TJ Hawkinson. All oh, but, but TJ on. Hawkinson hasn't practiced in full in a month because of an ear infection and a low back or maybe a contract. He'll I don't still know. He'll be fine. We'll see. Either one, he's going to be out there week, week one. one you don't think go. he's going to be out there week one catching tutties? You're Raging. out of your mind. Eight did you catches not, did you for not just 20. listen to the agent say that when the scout, and I mean scout, said be here tomorrow, he was like, done. What do you think happens when the GM calls you and goes, hey, you're feeling good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm feeling way better now. I'm feeling way better. Yeah, good. We, we thought you weren't ready to go week one, which meant bad things for you later on. Okay, nope. just double checking. Good nah, to go. No I'm good. I'm, problem. I'm, good. Uh, I'm excited for Fat Guy Fantasy also to start yes. week one. Oh, we'll go, hey, we'll, we start tomorrow, right? Let's see tomorrow. who we got. Oh, Who's playing? No, it's tomorrow? in a week. A, a week, week from tomorrow. Dummy. A week. Yeah, yeah, dude. Kansas you get City, a week. Kansas City plays Detroit week one. I'll have the first guy up, Frank Ragnow. I was gonna say. And then first. next, so next, we're gonna record next Wednesday, and we'll do some more. Like, I don't know. We'll make some dumb predictions for the season, and we'll Can't uh, wait. We'll send you all off into the 2023 <laughs> NFL season. All right, Mackie, I got I got to ask you before we break here. Uh, Gophers Vikings. Oh, or, dude, or Gophers, the, Gophers, uh, Gophers, Huskers, Gophers, that was Huskers. That's my list of dumb questions. Because it, it is a dumb question. It's coming. Who's going to win between Gophers uh, and Nebraska? Uh, wh- give me a score prediction. What do you got? What's the spread right now? I don't do we know. know. I don't pay attention to that shit. What time? Um, you either win or you lose, Mac. You here's what I'm worried about. Here's what I'm worried about. You guys have been able to study like six years of PJ Fleck Gophers film. We have we got nothing on you. It's, nothing. A new, it's a new coaching staff. Now I will say this: you have a little bit that our defensive coordinator came from Syracuse last year, who you guys did play in the bowl game. Okay, so, so there's can, a little bit of like schematics yeah. there. You know what's funny? I will say this: you know, as a University of Minnesota alumni, love 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 my school. Uh, we don't draw the. You know, we're not filling you know, like these hundred thousand seat stadiums. So it's like a 50,000, 55,000 seat stadium or something like that. Maybe I'll call it 50,000 and it's sold out. And PJ Fleck, the Gophers coach is thumping his chest. Like this is the culture we've built. I guarantee you there's going to be 15,000 red shirts. Thousand <laughs> at minimum 20,000 red shirts. This is the closest home game we play or away game we play. I know. There is no other away game that we play that is closer. The, and like the fandom couldn't be more excited right now. There will be twenty to twenty five thousand Husker fans in that stadium this weekend. We have a tailgate lot. Is that well? You're welcome to come hang out and jump D2? through a flaming table if you would like to. Jesus. Shut no. up. No one's asking you. I think oh, I think Huskers I win. I think Huskers win. Teams. I think Huskers win twenty four seventeen. Twenty four seventeen. Um, I mean, I just like the, the the surprise factor is like the only thing I, that I would be scared about, and it is a big thing. It's week one, weird things happen, but I'm going row the boat, Sky Yama, go Gophers, and it'll be. I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna say thirty one. They're gonna light it up a little bit. Thirty one to twenty one. When's the last time the Gophers scored thirty one points? Oh, dude, they'll light it up once in a while. Okay. Well, I'm steak and a beer. Say, early in the beer. season. Steak and a beer. They bet? dropped. They dropped like 31 on uh, Ohio State a couple years ago. Steak and a, a beer. Steak and a beer bet. On the 31. Let me no, just, no, 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 no. Just steak and a beer on, on game. straight up, straight up, straight oh, up. Oh, absolutely. Steak, steak and a beer. Yes. Can I, get, right. can I be a part of 100%. this? No. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, you'll get your chance. You'll get your no, chance. No, no. I'll, I'll I'll split the bill with somebody. I'm in. I'm in all the way. <laughs> How about I'm you just pick FOMO, it up? FOMO, FOMO, FOMO. <laughs> can't be can't be left can out. I, I don't I don't want to be left out. <laughs> can I just come to dinner? No, you can Please. come to dinner. You're oh, gonna okay. be in the national you championship can, game. You can you fine. can buy the apps. Okay, perfect. Yeah, buy, I'm in. You can buy the calamari. Buy the squid. I'm in for the calamari. Right. Somebody else is paying for my steak. I'm in. All right. All right. Sounds good. Okay, we got a steak and a beer bet here. Steak and hey, by the way, what time's this game on at? Three thirty. Seven o'clock. Seven tomorrow night. Who plays three thirty on a Thursday? D2. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Remember those Toledo games? And you just see oh, it. dude. Maction Tuesdays? Maction Tuesdays Let's are go, the dude. best. So Football mad. season's back, boys. I, I, know, I, back. Thought, it was, I thought you guys were in the Mac. My bad. My bad. Shut up. Oh, that's right. Yeah. We added USC and all those other crap. Oh, hey. Oh, Alex, I got something. Hold on one second here. Yeah. Oh, right, right there for you. <laughs> oh, 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 good one, PJ. Yeah, why, don't you make, yeah. why don't you make it a cool line? Hey, go Big Red, baby. That's all I got to say. Go, 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 go Big Red. Go, go, Scotty, go Big Red. Go Big Red.